Hi everyone, my name is Meg Caddy and today I'm going to be reading from my book Slipping the Noose as part of the Premier's Reading Challenge. This book is for teenagers, it's a young adult book, so probably if you're 14 or older this one's a good one for you. So I'm going to be reading from chapter 1. I sat in the belly of the ship with my daughter curled in my lap. Nine months old now, her hair thickening and coming in curly red just like mine. She was a fretful child clingy and crying, and the other prisoners hated her, hated me. I was grateful for the chains that held us all in place, only because they put some small distance between me and the other men and women being hauled across this ocean to London like so much ballast. Many were pirates, but I didn't know them. They didn't seem to know me either, even by reputation. I would have given a lot to see a familiar face, to have an ally, but my lads were gone. All I had was this tiny stranger in my arms, this helpless creature that needed me so badly. Six weeks out from Jamaica and it was cold. The hatch wasn't battened down properly and sometimes when we lurched it clapped open and sent icy salt water sloshing down the companionway. One of the other prisoners gave a hacking cough, another swore. I gathered the girl as far from the water as I could. Pneumonia would kill her. I'd seen some of the other prisoners slip away already from scurvy or hunger, dysentery or rotting wounds. Disease rattled through the hull relentlessly. Every few days the soldiers came down and removed bodies, lugged them over the side with just a few perfunctory prayers. The ship that had sweltered when we were wallowing off the coast of Africa had become bitter as we entered the English Channel, and then the mouth of the Thames. We weren't allowed above deck, but I could figure where we were from the movement of the ship, from the calls of the sailors, from the air and the water that sometimes surged down the companionway and into the hold where we were crammed. I was wearing skirts and a thin shirt, but they'd given us rough blankets to keep the cold English spring from finishing us off. Mine was wrapped around the baby. My head drooped over her now. Molly, I'd called her, after my mother. She slept poorly, was always hungry and often sick. I was too famished to give milk now, but I could dip the hard biscuits in water and feed them to her when they were soft enough. They were just enough to keep her alive. I didn't know what would become of us both when we docked and were shoved into prison. I suspected it was my father who paid to save me from the noose, to have me sent away from the Americas. But money only went so far. I drifted in and out of sleep with her, lulled by the rock of the ship and the kiss of waves rasping against the hull. She was a bigger vessel than I'd ever sailed on, made for the long and dangerous voyage across the Atlantic, rather than skipping from coast to coast in the Caribbean. But it was still a ship. When I closed my eyes, it was easy to pretend I was somewhere else, far from the stench and rot, and that Calico and Reed were up in the rigging, or sleeping a few feet away. I'd taken refuge in that fantasy often enough while we were at sea. It never lasted long. Clear skies filled with smoke, the smell of gunpowder and blood. I watched Isaac, our steadfast helmsman, bleeding out on our quarterdeck. The pirate hunter Jonathan Barnett, our longtime enemy, swung onto our ship with triumph in his eyes. In all my dreams I searched for Calico, and he was just out of reach. I always woke with his voice in my ears. Annie, do you love me? Ah, Calico, I came to sea with you, didn't I? No more Calico Jack now. No more bright-eyed sailor boy. They hanged him alongside Richard Corner and George Featherstone. Afterwards they took his body down and covered it with tar. Then they put him in a gibbet and strung him out by the ocean to be worried by the gulls and the spray. If he had any last words, I never knew what they were. The child I held now was all he'd left me. And Reed? Reed. The thought of him made me ache. My brother in arms. We had gone to trial together, but I hadn't seen him since. I'd heard rumours that he died the previous April, alone in the stifling Jamaican prison, that he'd been buried in an unmarked grave. Barnett had run his flag up our mast and scattered us to the winds. And now I was the only one left. The companionway clapped open and I jumped. Cold grey light streamed in, followed by the slosh of rain. I gathered Molly away from it, but she was already awake and crying. I bounced her, murmuring quietly, but my attention was elsewhere. I knew the sounds of a ship dropping anchor. I knew the sounds of jetties and gulls, of steve doors and sailors. When the hatch opened and sailors came down, they brought with them the thick, briny stench of the river. The sea was far behind us now. We were in London. 
One of the guards came down the companionway, pointing a musket at my face. Up. My stomach dropped as I struggled to my feet. It never boded well to be singled out. Molly wailed against my shoulder, her body straining and shivering, and there was a dread moment when she cried so hard there was no sound. Then she drew breath and let loose again, even louder. Listen, I said, I don't know what my father's paying you. It could be a lot if he'd felt moved to pay anything at all, but we can work something. Shut your mouth. Another man came down the companionway. He came over to me, reaching his arm out for Molly, and I realised too late what he wanted. No! My arms tightened around her. No, she's mine! He slapped me in the face as I turned, trying to put him at my back and pin Molly between myself and the wall. I'd lost enough. I'd lost too much. Not Molly, not Molly. She screamed hoarsely, frightened now, uncomfortable in my grip. The guard grabbed me by my hair and yanked me back, the barrel of the musket pushing into my throat and clashing against my jaw as the second guard wrenched Molly from my arms. I screamed and lunged, musket be damned, but the butt of the weapon slammed into my temple and knocked me to the ground. He took Molly up the companionway and out of my sight. The first man bound my hands. I struggled and swore, thrashing, and he knelt on my back to pin me down. I could hardly hear Molly now. My pulse beat in my ears, my throat, my temples. I wanted to kill them all. Steady, Bonnie. Play it smart. Bide your time. Martin Reed lived only in my head now. But his voice calmed me, stilled me. I was alive. I was uninjured. And I knew what I had to do, even if I didn't have a plan. Yet. The air off the Thames was chill and rancid. They gathered us like livestock onto the small boat, bound by thick ropes in our hands. The men in front of me hunched their heads against the whip of the wind. Water danced up over the sides and sloshed over our bare feet. By the time the boat had pushed away from the ship, I'd lost all feeling in my toes. I was at the back, crammed into the corner where the sides met, looking desperately for the men who'd taken Molly. There was no sign of them or of her. Some of the jolly boats had already been lowered, bringing men to shore. Where had they taken her? London rose up on all sides of us, narrow grey buildings looming across the river as the sun started to lower over the city. Small boats sped across the heaving body of water, ferrying people and goods across. The boatmen were skilled, dodging about one another and through the pillars of the big bridge ahead of us and the jetties stretching out from the land. I could see people on the shore, walking or in carriages, packing up their wares for the day, heading home. London was a strange creature to me, unknown and dangerous, but I knew the world of the waterways. Maybe it would be enough to get me a start. I bent over my hands, putting a shiver through my shoulders and letting my hair drape over my front. Let them think I was weeping or steeling myself against the cold. My fingers twisted over the knots, looking for the loosest one. They hadn't bothered with chains, not on this tiny boat, because what sort of idiot would try to escape? Echoes of Reed's voice drifted through my head. Steady, Bonnie. Every few moments I lifted my eyes, checking the guards ahead of us and the other prisoners, making sure no one was looking back. We were closer to the bridge now, a monstrous thing with buildings all along its length. It was supported by thick pillars through which water coursed impossibly fast. I watched a small boat shoot through ahead of us, picking up speed and careening to the sides as the water tossed it back and forth. I caught my breath. This was it. This was my opportunity. Perhaps the only one I'd get. My fingers were numb and stiff, and it was hard to find the right loop to pull for all the experience I'd had with ropes at sea. I breathed through my frustration, tried to warm my fingers with my breath. The wind was so full it stopped in my throat and made me lightheaded. My hands hurt, raw and chafed, my nails grew, grew ragged as I prized them through the thick rope, picking loose wire-like strands. I couldn't tell if it was starting to give or if I was imagining it. The water beneath us was picking up, the edges of each wave curling forwards in white ridges as I sped towards the bridge. This was madness and I knew it. The water was cold and dark, deep here and too fast to navigate. I could drown in the undertow or be slammed into a pillar. I could be caught and beaten or picked off with musket shot before I could reach the shore. I could die of the cold, or wash up on the banks and die of the rotten ruin carried in this putrid stream. Our small boat lurched towards the pillars, and there was a desperate moment when the guards struggled to put us back on course to keep us from slamming into the bricks. We veered to the side. One of the other prisoners cried out as his head hit the side of the boat. 
I didn't care about discretion now. I only had moments, the barest instant, before we'd be shot through the underside of the bridge. The knots started to give. We slipped into the shadow of the bridge. I kicked up and dropped backwards off the boat, letting the river swallow me whole. The undertow sucked me in, pulled me back and then flung me forwards. The world was black and bubbles, water hammering against my face, fighting its way into my lips, down my throat. Cold, so cold, colder than anything I'd known. I kicked, felt my shoulder slam against something. I screamed and gulped another mouthful of water. I swung my good arm, made contact, gripped something slippery and cold, dragged my head out of the water, coughing and choking. I threw the other hand up, but the pain ripped through me all the way down to the fingertips, pulled another muffled scream from my mouth that was lost in the roar of the water. I dangled there, clinging to the large, thick chain loop that hung from the bridge as the water coursed past me and the prison boat was carried away. I struggled to breathe, struggled to do anything with my shoulder throbbing and my muscles locked tight against the cold. I couldn't hang there indefinitely. Just a moment, though. Not much longer. Just long enough to put some distance between me and the boat. Suddenly the boat stopped, the oars working back and forward as they realised I was gone. They tried to turn, but the river was in full body at this hour, and the tide dragged them away, carrying them dangerously close to a jetty. I shivered, teeth chattering and fingers growing numb and hollow as I waited. Just go, just go, I willed them. What's one more prisoner to you? At length, they must have come to the same conclusion. Better to let one prisoner drown in the storm-swelled river than to lose the whole, lose the whole boatload. They started to row again. I didn't want to drop back into the water. Didn't want to leave the bridges underbelly. But I had to get to shore. Every breath, breath of cold air through my gritted teeth made them ache. I'd never known such cold, but I knew it would be the end of me if I left this too long. The way out is through. I dropped back into the rancid heart of the Thames. The water spat me forwards, sending me in a torrent of foam and spray after the prison boat. I kicked, wishing I had Reed's strength and endurance. Every stroke pulled along my shoulder. I sobbed through gulps of air, lungs straining. My clothes dragged on me. I beat my legs against the current, swimming for that jetty the boat had swung towards. The water was foul, stinging my eyes and throat, burning through me. I gagged and spluttered, found myself swept beneath the wooden planks. I hooked my leg around one of the supporting beams, pulled myself back and stayed there, getting my breath. Then, painfully slow, I dragged myself onto the jetty and dropped onto the planks, rolling onto my back to breathe the free air. Thank you for reading along with me, everyone. Uh, if you're interested in reading further, you can pick up a copy of Slipping the Noose or the prequel Devil's Ballast. Uh, and you can now log this as part of your Premier's Reading Challenge. Thank you, everyone.